became concerned about this Rocky Flats matter um, several years ago, and, and I want to start off by saying um, it's a real honor to be able to make a small contribution to this community. Um, you know, to quote Isaac Newton, uh, if, if I have seen anything, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And the person who deserves the most credit uh, f from, from my perspective for me is Kristen Iverson. I read Full Body Burden in 2012, 2013, got interested in the issue, read uh, The Ambush Grand Jury, read uh, Len Ackland's um, Making a Real Killing, and um, I am just amazed and impressed by the dedication of the principals in this community. And we have one of those principals in the room here tonight, Mr. John Lipsky, who changed the course of history around here um, with respect to the Rocky Flats plant. And 30 years later, uh, John is still as passionate about this cause as, as back in 1988, and it just blows me away. So. Um, what I want to do tonight is present the results of uh, research that I've done over the last year or so, just, um, just digging through old documents, basically. Um, I, I want to emphasize a certain caveat. I am not a chemist. Um, I am not a nuclear physicist. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist. I am a software architect and my education is in mathematics and computer science. But um, I know how to read, and I know how to do research, and I know right from wrong, okay? And so uh, I've checked my unit conversions pretty carefully in this presentation, and if I've made a mistake, I apologize. But um, anyway, with that, and I'm, I'm a little bit uh, debilitated here because my notes are way back there on my computer, and I'm up here without my computer. So there's no uh, video hookup up here, so I'm trying to remember the notes from memory. But with that, uh, let's get started, please, if you could advance the slide, Alicia. Um, I, I, I have four main topics I want to cover in this talk. Uh, it's, the talk is about off-site soil contamination studies that have been done in the past and uh, health impact studies that have done in, been done in the past. But before that, I want to set a little bit of context, I'll just go over some basic stuff. And uh, after that, I want to just have some, some reflections on, on this whole subject. So uh, I chose to focus on plutonium specifically because um, Plutonium, I, I know there are other contaminants of concern from the Rocky Flats plant besides plutonium. There's americium, there's beryllium, there's volatile organic compounds like carbon tetrachloride. Um, but plutonium has been the most well studied. Um, there, there have been at least a dozen studies of plutonium contamination in the soil off site from the plant area. And also on the health studies side, um, I know that there have, there have been a variety of different kind of health impacts from Rocky Flats contamination, um, cancers, uh, neurological issues, potentially um, autoimmune issues, thyroid issues, but only cancer has been studied. So that's, that's what I'm focusing on because that's what the available studies are on, plutonium and cancer incidents. So with that, if we could go on. Um, uh, in, in the context setting, I want to talk a little bit about just how this is a unique local problem and uh, a little bit about plutonium and units of measure that are used. There's lots of different units of measure and you have to convert and it's a pain in the butt. Um, and talk a little bit about background radiation and what were the contamination sources from Rocky Flats. So you can advance, please. Um, so, so we have a, a very unique local problem here. There, there's no place in America like Rocky Flats for a variety of reasons. First of all, uh, Rocky Flats proximity to the metropolitan area, if, if you look into the history, um, you know, the, the, a mistake was made putting the plant site upwind and upslope from a metropolitan area. The, the uh, mission and history of Rocky Flats, Rocky Flats was the only facility in the United States nuclear weapons complex that produced the plutonium cores of our nuclear weapons, um, 70,000 of them. Um, those plutonium cores were then shipped to Pantex in Texas to, to assemble into the larger bomb, but um, no other facility did this except Rocky Flats. 
And then finally, the, the, the history with the fires and the 903 area and the FBI raid and the cleanup, that's all pretty unique. And this, the specific mix of contaminants that were released into the environment. Um, that's what makes this a unique local problem, if you could hit the arrow key, please. Um, and what, what's happening is that people are moving here from out of state in some, in some cases or um, from other places in the state and they're buying these half million, three quarter million dollar homes in the, the new neighborhoods that have been developed around Rocky Flats and they're getting sick and it's having a major impact on their lives. And um, furthermore, we're about to open the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge uh, trail system to public access so people can go ride horses and ride mountain bikes and hike around in that contaminated dust out there. And we're about to put the Jefferson Parkway in right up Indiana Street, which is very contaminated. Um, and that, that'll, that'll involve a lot of earth moving activity and potentially dust in the air. And it just seems pretty senseless to me. I don't understand the, the whys of it all, the whys and wherefores. Uh, if you could hit the button, please. So we need to own this problem and try to make sensibility prevail. Uh, we can't do anything about what's happened in the past, per se, but we can at least try to avoid exacerbating the problem. And what I know that um, in 1979, the, the then director of the Colorado Department of Health, which is now called Colorado Department of Public Environment and Health, his name was Dr. Frank Trailer, and his son is actually a friend of mine. He wrote a memo in 1979 recommending that there be no new residential development between Sims Street and Highway 93, Highway 72, and Highway 128. So it's been almost, what, 40 years since he wrote that memo, and think of all the development that has gone in there. Uh, his, his memo was not heeded by the, the local governments, but to his credit, he advocated for only industrial and agricultural uses around there. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the big picture. Um, that gray area, odd-shaped gray area in the middle is roughly the former industrial zone of the plant, currently the DOE legacy retained area. The, the green area around it is the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, which was formerly the uh, buffer zone of the, the plant site. Together, those two areas comprise the plant site. And I want to point out that the only area in this picture that was remediated or, or cleaned up was that gray area, the, in, the industrial uh, area, the Superfund site. The refuge area was not remediated at all, and the off-site areas were not remediated at all. Um, so next slide, please. And, but, you know, I'm going to be talking about some of these metric prefixes, so I just wanted to go through them. Um, the most important ones are, are pico. A pico is one trillionth of, of one, okay? So centi is one one hundredth, milli is one one thousandth, micro is one one millionth, nano is one one billionth, and pico is one trillionth. Um, these will come up later in, this, in the talk, so next slide, please. I'm going to take you back to high school chemistry class here. This is the periodic table of the elements. Um, plutonium is the element with 94 protons. It's an actinide, a heavy metal. It's down there in the sort of rose-colored row. It doesn't occur naturally except in very trace amounts. It's a man-made product. It's a decay product of um, uranium-238. And it has different isotopes. That means two different atoms, each with 94 protons, but a different number of neutrons, okay? So um, there are 20 different isotopes. The most common ones are 238 to 244, except for 243. I don't think there is a plutonium-243. And plutonium-239 in particular um, is fissile. It's capable of sustaining a, a nuclear fission chain reaction, which means an atom disintegrates and causes other atoms to disintegrate and so on. And if you have a sample of plutonium and it's pure enough, there's enough plutonium-239 in it, it's called weapons-grade plutonium. Okay, so that's just a little background on that. Next slide, please. So what happens with plutonium-239 radioactivity? Um, for, for whatever reason, an atom of plutonium disintegrates into two things. 
Um, one is an alpha particle, which is actually a helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. And the other is a uranium-235 atom. That's what, that's what happens when a plutonium-239 atom disintegrates. And it gives off some energy, uh, 207 mega electron volts. So um, one of the units that's used in this field is a becquerel. And a becquerel is actually an amount of plutonium. It's, it's the amount of plutonium that will have one of these disintegrations per second. Um, and it turns out that uh, one becquerel is about 435 trillionths of a gram, um, 435 picograms, which, if, if I understand correctly, is about 1.087 trillion plutonium atoms. Uh, 1.087 trillion plutonium atoms makes a becquerel. And then, as, as Alicia mentioned, the half-life of plutonium-239 is 24,000 years. So the, the half-life is, um, is a probability, actually. It's, uh, in 24,100 years, half, it's, it's, most, it's probable that half the number of atoms you have will have disintegrated into uranium. And it takes 10 half-lifes or a quarter million years for the stuff to kind of dissolve away and not be as dangerous. Okay, um, and I know I had some notes on this slide, but I can't see them, so let's move on. Um, so if my math is right, I apologize, I'm going to have to read this. Uh, the density of plutonium is 19.86 grams per cubic centimeter. I brought with me a couple of little dice here. I don't know if you can see these, but... Um, those are one cubic centimeter. So if I had 23 of these in my hand, it would weigh a pound. That's, that's how heavy this stuff is. Okay, so um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment says that plutonium-laden dust um, is in the three to 10 micrometer or micron range. So that's three to 10 millionths of a meter. The, since these guys are one centimeter each, if I lined up a hundred of them, I'd have a meter. That's about a yard. So um, um, if I divided this into, uh, I think, 10,000 pieces, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, 10 microns, if, if I remember right. Uh, a human hair is about 60 microns in diameter. So what this means is that um, a little particle of respirable dust is about uh, one 20th to 1 6th the width of a human hair. Okay, uh, so one cubic micron of plutonium 239 has about uh, 49 billion atoms. A 10 micron cube has 49 trillion atoms. So if, if you were unlucky enough to inhale a 3 micron cube of plutonium 239, you'd get 1.34 trillion plutonium atoms in your lungs and they would emit alpha particles at a rate of about 1.2 emissions per second. If you inhaled one of those bigger 10 micron cubes that CDPHE says is respirable, you'd get 50 trillion plutonium atoms in your lung, and it would emit an alpha particle 46 times a second, if, if my math is right. Next slide, please. Okay, so another important concept here is isotope ratios. Remember, plutonium comes in different isotopes, and um, the ratio of 239 to 240 atoms in a sample of plutonium is very important because it tells you where the plutonium came from. So earlier in the history of nuclear weapons development, the plutonium wasn't as pure. Um, you know, when back in the 50s or whenever it was that we used to explode atom bombs in the atmosphere, that plutonium had uh, six and a half plutonium-239 atoms for every plutonium-240 atom. So the, the ratio, the, the 240 to 239 ratio was 0.155 for global fallout. Rocky Flats plutonium is more pure. Um, for every 240 atom there you have 16 239 atoms. So it's more pure, more weapons grade. And this is important because if you get a piece of plutonium and figure out the isotope ratio, you can tell where it came from, global fallout or rocky flats. Uh, th this turns out to be very important in some of the studies that were done. Okay, next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about muni units of measure. Um, some of the older studies are in disintegrations per minute, per gram. So uh, remember, a becquerel is a disintegration every second, so that's 60 disintegrations per minute. 
There's this unit called a curie, which was the original measure of radioactivity. It turns out to be um, 2.22 2 trillion um, disintegrations per minute. A picocurie, or a trillionth of a curie then, is just 2.22 disintegrations per minute. And there are some other measures of concentration or inventory. When, when you count up how many disintegrations per minute per gram of soil do you have, that's a concentration measure. If you count up how many grams of plutonium are in a square kilometer, that's an inventory measure. And the studies use all these different kinds of measures and you have to convert between them and it's a pain in the butt. Okay, so, and, and to convert between um, surface area and, and um, weight, you have to know something about the density of the soil in question. And I've seen, I asked Michael Ketterer at, at Metropolitan State, um, and the densities tend to be 1.0 to 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So if, if, if this little die here was made out of Rocky Flats soil, it would weigh, well, I'm, I'm, I've been using 1.5 centimeter, or I'm sorry, grams in my calculations. Okay, so next slide, please. Another interesting question here is what number to use for background radiation? Um, there's background radiation everywhere from atomic weapons, atmospheric atomic weapons testing. Um, I've seen ranges from 0.01 disintegrations per minute per gram to 0.08 disintegrations per minute per gram on the Colorado Front Range. But the first concerned citizen to study off-site contamination at Rocky Flats, Dr. Edward Martell, used a number of 0 0.0434 disintegrations per minute per gram. That, that was an average that, that he found around Boyd Lake up in Loveland, Colorado, which was not contaminated. It, only, it was just whatever was there was from background. So I've been using 0 0.0434 disintegrations per minute per gram for background radiation. And the reason, I, the reason it's important to know a background number is because I like to think of the contamination in terms of a multiple of background. I mean, it, to me that's more meaningful than saying, well, you know, this particular sample had 10 picocuries per gram or, you know, a couple becquerels per square kilometer. What does that mean? It, it, well, it means it's 100 times background or 10 times background or something like that is more um, tangible. So next slide, please. So let's talk about where the plutonium contamination from Rocky Flats came from, how it originated. Um, the first event was the 1957 fire. September 11th, 1957, there was a major fire in the plutonium processing buildings which destroyed the, um, the HEPA filters and also destroyed the air monitors in the smokestacks that detected how much plutonium was going out the smokestacks. So flying blind for uh, plutonium going out the smokestacks for 13 hours no filters, and the, the winds at that time were out of the north apparently because the, this is a reconstructed smoke plume um, and the, 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 the plume blew south over downtown Arvada basically and then when it, kinda, when it got to the Platte River Valley it turned back northeast. This, was, this went on for 12 or 13 hours, a plutonium laden smoke plume blowing over the northwest metropolitan Denver area. And next slide, please. Um, the other major source of plutonium contamination was the 903 area. Um, starting in about 1958, I think it was, uh, Dow Chemical decided it was okay to put 55-gallon drums of plutonium-laced uh, oil out in a field. Um, and over the course of a decade, they put about 3,200 or 3,500 of these uh, drums out there. there. There were a total of 5,200 drums, but only 3,500 of them had the plutonium-laced oil in them. Well, these things started to corrode and leak their plutonium-contaminated oil into the ground, and this was known as early as 1959, and by 1962, 60% of those drums out there had corroded. And there was a big cleanup project in 1968 where they, they pumped the uh, the oil out of the remaining um, intact drums into, into new drums, and that supposedly uh, 
put a fine mist of oil into the air, according to some sources I've read. And, and this, there's a gentleman named uh, Jerry Harden who actually worked on that crew in 1968. Well, then after they had all the drums pumped out and moved off of there, they, they burned the vegetation, and that released plutonium-contaminated smoke into the air. And then after that, they road graded the, the ground, and that released dust into the air. And then they paved over it with asphalt, which um, uh, has since cracked and so on. So th this was the other major source of, of plutonium contamination. And it's, there's a conservative estimate that 86 grams of plutonium um, was released from the 903 area. I, I, I've read opinions that that's a woeful underestimate. But 86 grams is about 1.7 trillion of those little one micron cubes I was talking about a few slides ago. 1.7 1, 1 trillion inhalable particles um, if they're one micron in size. And the, so that's Google Maps there on the right. Um, the old east entrance to the plant is the road that goes from Indiana over to that red square. The red square is on the 903 area. Um, and if you hit the, the key, Alicia, what happened was um, the, the prevailing winds at Rocky Flats blew this contaminated soil to the southeast. Um, th this is, from what I've read, generally accepted as probably the biggest source of contamination from Rocky Flats. So, uh, next slide please, Alicia. Um, I'm, I'm a sailor, so I'm really interested in, in prevailing winds, and these, there's all kinds of wind roses from Rocky Flats. Th th so the way to read these charts, the, the length of the bar indicates the direction that the wind most frequently comes from. And the color of the bar indicates the wind strength. So, and, and interestingly at Rocky Flats, the, the wind direction is influenced by the topography. So the, the chart on the left is at Walnut Creek, which is farther north. The chart on the south is at Woman Creek, which is a little farther south. And you can see that at Woman Creek, the wind is coming from a little bit more of a northerly direction. This is 2001 data. This is actually CDPHE data from on-site air monitors. And if, if you look back at the various wind roses that are in print, they're, they're pretty consistent. The, the wind up there is pretty much from the west-northwest. Um, and it's most often the yellow color, it's um, five to 10 miles an hour. But when you get the super strong winds, like the light blue color at the end, they're always from that direction. Um, it's, next slide, please. So here is, in, in context, here's the 903 pad, the red square in, off of Google Maps in a, in a big picture, and if you hit the key once, um, that is east-southeast. That, that is the, the direction of the prevailing wind from the 903 pad. But of course, it doesn't blow in a nice straight line like that. One more key, please. I think what, what likely happens is this. Right, so you get a you get a dispersion effect, and th this shows up in the soil studies that have been done. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, just for fun, you know, we had that high wind event on April 17th. That's a week ago yesterday. Um, so I looked on Weather Underground to see what uh, st what stations are around Rocky Flats. I don't know if you guys use Weather Underground. It's it's fun, and there's a whole bunch of weather stations around. Rocky Flats there. There's one at, um, there's, there's one in Candalus, there's one in Whistle, uh, Whisper Creek. And it hit the next slide, please. So this is data from last Tuesday, um, a Weather Underground station at 96th and Indiana, that um, Rising Star Equestrian Center there. They apparently have a, a wind meter there. So this middle section, um, the blue line is the wind speed, the scale is in miles an hour, I think. The, the gold dots are gusts. So you can see that at about 3 o'clock or so, 2.30 or so last Tuesday, there were gusts, uh, hurricane strength gusts up there. Hurricane strength is 76 miles an hour. Um, so those couple little yellow dots up there. And, and it, so it was blowing 60 and gusting 75 up there. That's pretty darn windy. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I, I really wanted to get a picture of my boat into this presentation, <laughs> so I, I, I made this slide. Now, um, what this is for is, so I, I have a boat at Chatfield, a, a, a CNC 30, and the marina is at the head of the arrow there, 
and the swim beach is at the tail of the arrow. And, um, uh, you know, we had, so we had the same wind down south last Tuesday. And I, so I, I went to my boat on Wednesday last week because I race my boat every Wednesday night. And this topic is so important to me that I'm actually missing a yacht race tonight to give this presentation, okay? Well, so I get to my boat last Wednesday night and there's dust all over it. And I'm like, How, where the hell did this dust come from? And it finally, it finally dawned on me that the west side of Chatfield is being completely rebuilt this summer. That all the, there's a big earth movers down there. They've completely torn out the swim beach. They, they rebuilt the north lawn ramp. Well, that's where the dust came from. The, the wind blew the dust from the swim beach across the lake onto my boat last Tuesday. And that, that's a distance of over a mile. So that's, that's how dust moves in wind like that, okay? Um, plus, I got my boat into the, the talk. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a picture I took five days before that. I was driving west on C-470 from the tech center to Ken Carl, and it was a blustery day. It was blowing about 40. And uh, there's all kind of, uh, C-470 is being, re it's being widened, so there's construction out there. Well, look at all this dust. Um, the dust coming up from that dump truck tire, there's, there was so much dust from some piece of equipment ahead of that, it was basically make, making a driving hazard. That's what's going to happen uh, if the Jefferson Parkway is built. There's going to be that kind of construction dust. Okay, uh, next slide, please. That, okay, so that's the context stuff. Now let me get into the, uh, the actual soil studies, uh, if you could go to the next slide. The first one was a guy named Ed Martell, and I've got a little bit about his qualifications, his resume coming up later in the talk, but he, he worked, he was a, a very qualified PhD. He worked at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. He happened to notice the smoke plume from the Mother's Day 1969 fire um, from his perch up there at NCAR, and he started asking questions, and that, that led to a study. Um, and this was the first independent off-site soil study that was ever done of Rocky Flats. It was done in, um, it was reported in 1970. I think he took the samples in August of 1969. So he sent a letter to the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission with his, his findings. And there were follow-up reports um, a month later. And in May of 1970, he actually published his work in uh, Environment Magazine. and, and Two years later, he published his work in Health Physics Journal, which is, seems to be the most prestigious journal for nuclear physicists. That's where all the, the articles go. So he measured mostly the top one centimeter of soil. And this is one of the contentious points about soil measurement is how deep do you dig and how much averaging do you do and so on. Well, he found at um, Indiana Street and Woman Creek, uh, 311 times background. Um, that, that was the first, the first one. And a couple other places he found, uh, you know, 30 or 40 times background. So that, that was the very first one, 1970. And if you go to the next slide, please. So in, in response to that, um, the Atomic Energy Commission sent out some of their own scientists, a guy named um, uh, well, Cray and Hardy. One of them's first name is Paul. I can't remember which. Cray and Hardy. They came out to, to verify Martell and Poet. And they took 20-inch deep cores and... and basically blended the soil and, and averaged the plutonium concentration in those cores. So they came up with lower numbers, but the, the profile was about the same. Um, they, they found 49 times background just west of Great Western Reservoir. Um, so on, on the big map, it's kind of farther north on Indiana. And they found, you know, 10x more, 10x greater than background other places. So if you go to the next slide, they, they, they were, their study was responsible for the famous Cray-Hardy map that, that we always see. This was the original version of the Cray-Hardy map. It's in uh, millicuries per square kilometer. Um, and the, the, that white line I drew is Indiana Street, and that white circle I drew is 50 millicuries per square kilometer isopleth or, or band. Well, 50 millicuries per square kilometer is 171 times background um, using Martell's background number. And that, that band extends pretty far east of Indiana Street. Uh, and the, the, he, his lowest contour that he drew was 
three millicuries per square kilometer, which is 10 times background, and that went all the way east of uh, Highway 36 and all the way south of 64th Street. Okay, so next slide, please. So here's a, uh, uh, the, the fancier version of the Cray Hardy map. I actually don't know who created this, but it's in pretty wide circulation. Somebody color-coded those isopleths and changed the units from millicuries per square kilometer to becquerels per square meter, and I checked all those conversions, and they're right. I mean, who am I to check them? You know, somebody back in the day did this. And, um, so anyway, and this, this colored version leaves out that lowest uh, three millicurie per square kilometer contour. It's showing um, whatever that is, 185 to 200, 370 becquerels per square meter, only out to like 72nd Avenue and, and so on. So this is the Cray Hardy map. Okay, and the next slide, please. So after, after Martel and Cray and Hardy, Dow Chemical says, well, we're gonna, um, we're gonna get our own guys to study this. So they commissioned this uh, committee that was chaired by a guy named Robert Seed, and the, the committee was staffed by all Dow Chemical employees, and they created this paper called the Seed Report, which is exceptionally hard to find. Um, I had to get this by Freedom of Information Act request from Department of Energy. Well, the Seed Report not only corroborated Martell and Poet and Cray and Hardy, but it also came up with a slightly different isopleth contour map. Um, the sectors and the contours there are centered at the 903 area. Um, and they, Dow Chemical kept this study secret. It, it wasn't Department of Energy secret, it was Dow Corporation secret. And it finally was discovered during the Lamworth Task Force um, effort. And um, it, it ended up being cited by later papers, but um, Dow, Dow knew that those earlier reports were right and they, they kept it secret. So, um, they have, you see that little red stretch of Indiana that I, I drew in there? there? There's a band of contamination that they discovered uh, 50 to 100 millicuries per square kilometer, which is 171 to 341 times background radiation extending across Indiana there at about uh, Mower Reservoir, Mauer Reservoir, however you pronounce that. And then their, their lowest band was 13 millicuries per square kilometer, which is 44 times background. So, so now we have three reports all in 7071 saying the same thing. And, and by the way, this stuff lasts for 24,000 to 250,000 years. So unless it moves some way or somehow by wind or water, it's still there. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And then Carl Johnson, who was the former Jefferson County Health Director, he did his, an, another soil sample in 1976. Um, he published it in Science Magazine. He brushed the surface soil with a clean brush and put it in a clean container, so he was testing the very top layer of soil. And he did this because there were planning and zoning requests for new residential developments um, east of Indiana. So the way, he, the way he carved up the territory, uh, his highest finding was between Indiana Street and Alkire Street, um, between 104th and 112th if they went that far across, which they don't, but that little stretch, um, kind of north of 96, kind of south of Great Western Reservoir, 325 times background. And 68 times background between Indiana and Alkire, 96th and 104th. So now you got four guys in a span of six years who've pretty much found, you know, 300 times background all along that, that corridor there. Next slide, please. Um, then there were some guys named Ilsley and Hume who were employees of Rockwell, which took over after Dow. And they did a study in 1979 um, in response to the church lawsuit. So the sidebar, you know, the, the church family for whom Church Ranch Road is named had their ranch land appropriated by the U.S. government to create Rocky Flats, and then the government polluted their land, and they, they wanted to develop, um, and, and actually Candelas is the ultimate result of the church's desire to develop. Um, well, they sued the government for contaminating their land and making it less valuable to potential developers, and so this study was done by the defense in that lawsuit, 
and uh, Ilsley and Hume sampled at 71 locations outside the plant boundary, and I've circled a couple of their findings. Um, these are in disintegrations per minute per gram. So 174 times background just across Indiana from the old East Gate, where you used to go into the plant, and 46 times background a little farther south. Um, yeah, it's probably around 96th or so, I don't know. So now we're up to like five or six studies. Next slide, please. They just keep going. Um, they keep corroborating each other. This one, Dale Simpson sent me this one. I hadn't seen it before, but um, Jim Stone, who was a whistleblower, and uh, Ward Wicker from CSU, a couple other guys, did a study in 1994, which at those two spots, CX6 and CX7 down there, which are pretty close to the northern border of Candelas, kind of down in that Woman Creek drainage, they found um, a hot spot with 100 times background at CX6, and they found a hot spot 40 times background, 12 inches deep at CX7. And I thought that 12 inches deep part was interesting because a lot of the other findings are on, on the surface. So um, the, I don't think this study was, was published. I don't know how Dale got a hold of it, but he sent me a PDF scan of it. Uh, next one, please. And then Iggy, Iggy Latour. How do you pronounce his last name? Does anyone know how to? Latour. Iggy Latour. So he uh, did quite a few studies, and this one was titled uh, Plutonium Contamination Soils in Open Space and Residential Areas near Rocky Flats, Colorado, and it was published in Health Physics. And one of the things he did that was interesting, the little picture on the left, those, those dark crosses, he, he analyzed the isotope ratio in all his samples. So he could tell for a given sample, was this from background or was this from Rocky Flats? So all those little dark crosses were definitely Rocky Flats plutonium. Uh, the ratios are close to 0 0.06. And the farther away you go, the closer the ratios get to like 0.15 or 0.16, the background level. And so not only did he analyze isotope ratio, but um, in that right-hand picture just east of Indiana, sample number 30, 111 times background. So yet, yet another data point of 100 times background along Indiana. Next slide, please. Um, there was a study, I think this was part of, I don't know what this came out of, Neil Schoenbeck, and I'm not gonna read all this text here, but he basically says, uh, we don't find any bias in past sampling methods. Um, our results correlate well with previous investigators, including Latour. So, uh, Plutonium in soil close to the eastern edge of Rocky Flats plant was 10 to 100 times higher than average background for fallout. I don't remember off the top of my head what number he was using for background. If he was using a higher number than me, his multiple of background is lower than, than what I found. So Sean Beck, and next slide, please. Um, then there's, there's a part of the Centers for Disease Control called ASTDR, ATDSR rather, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and they, did sort of a meta-analysis, and uh, at that time it was called Rocky Flats Environmental Technology Site, RFETS, and they reported up to 400 times um, background being found in off-site studies, 150 to 400. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, Leroy Moore hired a guy named Marco Keltofen in 2011 or 12 to do an independent study along Indiana Street, which he did, and he found um, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, 1.5 to 81x uh, background um, at these locations, Indiana and 96th, 81x. I don't really know why his numbers were a little bit lower, but from 1970 to 2012, that's 42 years, you have 10 different scientists or, or 10 different studies finding 10 to hundreds of times background radiation kind of in that Indiana corridor there. Next slide, please. And th this is the one that I think is the, the icing on the cake. Um, in 2013, the Department of Energy and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment gave a briefing to the Rocky Flats Stewardship Council explaining why, or ex explaining the decision to not remediate the offsite areas. And in their briefing, this is actually a, out of their slide, they have their own isopleth map there, and you can see the the two and the five up there. So they have a band of five picocuries per gram going east of Indiana Street. 
Well, five pico curious per gram is 256 times background. So th this is CDPHE's own data. Um, and they didn't uh, remediate um, any of this. Um, and and over, over time, CDPHE has um, done more averaging of deeper cores, so it kind of looks like the level of contamination is going down with time, but it's just because of their sampling technique. They also have a habit of averaging. So they take some samples and they, they get the concentrations and then they average all those samples across a gigantic area and that totally neglects the effect of hot spots. So um, if, if you're a child and you're playing in a piece of dirt, you know, if you're lucky, that piece of dirt is not a hot spot, but if you're unlucky, that piece of dirt is a hot spot. And, and averaging is just completely inappropriate and irresponsible, in my opinion. Susan, yes. I also understand from some of my work that um, DOE and the health department double corrected for background. Double corrected for background. Oh, okay. So their multiples of background are half. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think that's the last one. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, so one thing I ran out of time to do, which I will do next. Um, here's the Google Maps of Indiana Street from Highway 72 up to Highway 128. I'm going to annotate this map with little color-coded symbols with the ba background multiple. The symbol will say what study it came from. The color will say what multiple of background it is. And I'm going to use the I'm going to use such a diagram in, in in my work on the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee. Um, so we, we have a dozen studies showing that this corridor is polluted um, to hundreds of times background. And basically, it's the part, it's the part from, I want to say, 96th up to Great Western Reservoir that's probably the worst of it. Um, yeah, so sorry I didn't get that done in time, but I, I just made my last couple of slides an hour ago. Um, uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about public health studies. There are a lot fewer of these, unfortunately. Um, and next slide, please. So that same um, ATDSR that's part of the Centers for Disease Control, um, can you advance one? Is it not advancing? Oh, there it goes. So they wrote this long blurb, which you may or may not already know. Um, th so they have a, um, for every contaminant known to man, this organization has a document that's all about the contaminant. So this is their, Toxicity profile on plutonium. And it says, cancer is the major latent harmful effect produced by ionizing radiation. Um, the ability of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation to produce cancer in every tissue in the body has been demonstrated in laboratory animals. It's not an immediate effect. There's a latency period. Um, leukemia is the shortest latency with two years. And other cancers have a latency period of 20 years or more. Um, the mechanisms involved are not well understood quite yet, but uh, exposure to ionizing radiation can produce cancer at any site within the body, the most common ones being breast, lung, stomach, and thyroid, according to essentially the Centers for Disease Control. Next slide, please. So uh, Carl Johnson, who was the Jefferson County Public or Health Director, Health Department Director, was the first guy and the only guy to ever publish an epidemiological study of cancer incidents in the downwind population from Rocky Flats in a peer-reviewed medical journal. Um, he published it in a Swedish journal called Ambio. Um, and this was uh, a, a serious study where he looked at cancer incidents for certain kinds of cancer um, that was first diagnosed in, I think it was 1969 to 1971 in populations downwind of Rocky Flats. And the way he um, carved up the population is by census tract. And a, a census tract is a pretty fine-grained little piece of geography. It's, it's finer grained than a zip code, uh, for example. So he, he did his study by um, looking in the Colorado Cancer Registry at new diagnoses of certain kinds of cancers that were reported in 69 to 71 and comparing against a control population. And, uh, and this was all at census tract granularity and he found that males in particular had 24% uh, higher incidence of all cancers 
in the downwind population than would be expected um, in, in the general population. And there were some other numbers of, in his study. Um, most of the excess cancers were leukemias, lymphomas, myelomas, lung, thyroid, breast, esophagus, stomach, and colon cancer, similar to survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he noted. And cancer of the gonads, especially the testes, and in females, pancreas and brain, uh, contributed to the higher incidence of cancers. So this was a, a pretty serious finding. Um, and I think he did this because at the time, Jefferson County commissioners asked him to weigh in on uh, rezoning requests for residential developments, which prompted both his soil studies and his epidemiological studies. And this, this is still pretty much the best example out there because it was peer reviewed and it's pretty old data. Um, next slide, please. So in that same, um, Church versus United States lawsuit, um, there was a researcher who worked for plaintiff's counsel, his name was Stephen Chin, and he looked at the same cancer registry data but analyzed it a different way. He did a multiple regression analysis, which is a statistical technique that allows you to find out um, which factors contributed most. So um, was it, uh, what, 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 he, what he found was that the direction you lived from the 903 area was the most important factor in the, high, in the highest cancer incidence, so with um, east-southeast being worst. So if you lived up there around, say, 108th and Sims, that was worst. Um, if you lived north of the plant or west of the plant or even south of the plant, no cancer or less cancer. The second most important factor that Chin found was um, how close did you live to the plant? You know, inside of which one of those isopleths did you live? So the closer you lived and the, the more directly downwind you were from the 903 pad were the most important factors in increased cancer incidence according to Chin. Th this study was never published. It was um, part, it was a, basically an exhibit in a lawsuit, um, but I, it, it's available if you ever wanna go look at it in the CU Norland Library. Um, I have a copy of it, and that's that. Uh, next one, please. Then John Cobb, this, this was a really interesting one. This is not an epidemiological study per se, but uh, John Cobb was a department chair at the CU School of Medicine. He was a professor of preventative medicine, and he ran a long-running EPA-funded study to um, analyze liver and lung tissue collected at autopsy from deceased downwinders with permission from their families and compared to a control population in Pueblo. I think he analyzed a total of 519 people. Um, and he found that the amounts of plutonium in the downwind population were not that much different from the amounts of plutonium in the control population from Pueblo. They are about the same. But what was really important about his study was that the isotope ratio of the plutonium in the downwinders clearly indicated that it came from Rocky Flats. Um, so these people that lived downwind of Rocky Flats somehow got Rocky Flats plutonium into their livers and lungs. How did that happen? I, I, I'd have to go reread the study to see if he even speculates about that, but how the hell did these people get Rocky Flats plutonium in their livers and lungs? And there was a, actually a proposal for a follow-on study to um, understand the cause of death of these people whose tissue was collected at autopsy and try to correlate cause of death to presence of plutonium, but that follow-on study was never funded or done as far as I can tell. So th this was just analyzing the question of do these people have plutonium in their tissues or not? And the answer is yes, they do, and in fact, it came from Rocky Flats. Next slide, please. Okay, then there was a guy named Stephen Crump, who in 1984 to 1987 did some studies using the same cancer incidence data that Carl Johnson and Stephen Chin used, and he replicated their results. Um, he got the exact same answers, but then he did this unorthodox thing of adjusting for whether they lived in an urban area or not. And the way he adjusted for their urban area was by measuring the distance of their residence from the state capital of Colorado. And that, that uh, completely changed his results. 
Um, I think his study also included residents of the city of Boulder. Um, and this was a, a DOE funded study, if I remember correctly, um, DOE or CDPHE. And so later, later in history, there was an epidemiologist named Richard Clapp who testified in Cook v. Rockwell. And I've read Clapp's report from, from that case, and he reported that he called Stephen Crump and asked him, why did you do this adjustment for urbanization? And Dr. Clapp, who's very qualified in epidemiology, concluded that this urbanization adjustment was highly unorthodox. So I just include, I, I included Crump's study because it's one of the half dozen that's been done, but it was funded by either DOE or CDPHE, and it came up with um, results that disagreed with, with Johnson and Chin. Um, and it was, it was unusual, the, the methodology. So next slide, please. Um, then finally, there's uh, Richard Clapp, um, as I mentioned. So he, he's a PhD epidemiologist from Boston University, and he was a former director of the Massachusetts Cancer Registry. Pretty qualified guy. He testified in Cook v. Rockwell. Um, he, he analyzed newer cancer data than 69 to 71. I think he analyzed data um, up through 2004. And he found 29% uh, greater lung risk, lung cancer risk in isoplefts closest to the, the plant. Um, and I already mentioned his, uh, his comments on Crump's study. So Clapp, Clapp was pretty important because he, he was well qualified and newer, but again, this was an exhibit in a court case. It's, it's not published. One more please, Alicia. And then we have the CDPHE. So CDPHE conducts its own cancer studies, and um, they have a variety of methodological flaws in their studies, in my opinion. They use regional statistical areas, which are much larger grained than um, census tracts, or they use zip codes, which are also larger grained than census tracts. Um, they include a lot of areas north of Highway 128, which were unexposed. Um, they're not downwind, there's no contamination there, so they find lower cancer incidence there. Um, they don't analyze certain important kinds of cancers, um, cancers of the gonads, cancers of the thyroid, and their studies are based on uh, estimates of population, not actual counts of population. These are, these are some of the flaws in their studies. And there's, there's been absolutely no study of anything else ex except for cancer. There's been no study of multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or autoimmune disorders or um, thyroid issues besides cancer, which arguably should have been, in my opinion, CDPHE's job. Their mission is to um, protect the health of Colorado's people. Uh, and in my opinion, they're failing at it. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. That, so that's the end of the six known health studies of the downwind population. And the only one that um, concludes there's no issue is CDPHEs. Um, Johnson, Chin, and even Crump found higher cancer incidence in, until Crump did weird things. Cobb found Rocky Flats plutonium in the tissues of deceased downwinders, and so on. So a little bit of reflection on all this, if you could go to the next slide. There, CDPHE and DOE and, and the people whose, whose field this is, they, they want to connect certain dots to figure out a, a person's cancer risk. They, they want to figure out um, what's the concentration of the contaminant in the environment, it, the soil or the air or the water. And then from there they go to um, what is a person's exposure to that contaminant. And then from there they go to um, Okay, given that exposure, what was their dose of the contaminant? And then finally they say, okay, given that dose, what's that person's risk of disease or excess risk of a disease? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of places where that can be wrong when, when you're connecting all those dots. Um, maybe you're averaging the concentrations when you shouldn't. Maybe you're taking too deep of a soil core when, you, when all the contaminant is on the surface. Maybe your exposure calculations or assumptions are wrong. You know, may, maybe the dose that you assume from that exposure is wrong. M maybe the risk that you calculate from that dose is wrong. Well, um, 
The other factor that plays in here is our knowledge of radiation's effect on public health is evolving. We've, we've only known about this, these chemical elements for 70 years or so, and um, we, we're probably learning new things all the time. And what if the limits provided by the regulations are too lax? I, there's another slide I didn't have a chance to make, but in 1971, Colorado adopted a standard for uh, soil concentration of plutonium of 0 0.2 disintegrations per minute per gram. Um, that was adopted by the then director of Colorado Public Health Department. His name was Cleary, Clear, Robert Cleary or something like that. That was January 71. Three months later, um, April of 71, he changed it to 2.0 disintegrations per minute per gram. So uh, one order of magnitude, 10 times higher soil standard. Apparently arbitrarily, I, I've read the, the document where he changed it to, from 0.2 to 2.0 and it says based on a review by the Colorado Attorney General, um, they just they arbitrarily upped the soil standard. So, uh, yeah, Susan. Do you think that could have been because of the settlement agreement I wondered about that, but it predated the church lawsuit by four years. Church lawsuit was filed in 75. But they were doing studies. Before? Yeah, it's possible. I, but it's, it, it just seems kind of arbitrary to me. Um, so next slide, please. Um, Here's, here's where I'm happy to bring in a little something from my professional field. I've spent quite a bit of my life working on high-scale software systems. Um, for example, the, the system that Union Pacific Railroad uses to do all its freight planning. Um, high-scale websites that are used heavily on Cyber Monday, etc. And one of my favorite authors in this field is a guy named Eberhard Recton. He writes about architecting high-scale systems. And, one of the quotes in this book is that a model is not reality. Um, and a model is an abstraction of what the participants think and hope the system and its environment will look like. Participants in this case being DOE, CDPHE, anybody who comes up with those connect the dots things. What actually results is almost always different. And I've seen this, um, you know, I've used formulas before to try to calculate, you know, how much network bandwidth will be consumed by a redistribution of data in a distributed data storage system or how long that'll take. And the formulas are always wrong compared to when you actually measure it. You know, when you, when you actually look at the network bandwidth and the traffic and uh, the software on each side is slow, the, the amount of time it takes is always more than what you think it should be. So um, there, there's a quote that they used to use uh, in the aerospace industry. Uh, I think it goes back to uh, Kelly Johnson and, and Lockheed. Uh, Before the flight, it's opinion. After the flight, it's obvious. <laughs> the, the flight in this case being the release of contaminants from Rocky Flats, um, unfortunately. Um, and to me, to me, what's obvious here is, is the, um, the incidence of health problems. Um, so those, those measurements put all this risk modeling and stuff to shame. Um, when, when, when you actually measure the cancer incidence, it doesn't matter. Dose reconstruction studies and those type of things don't matter. It's, it's conjecture um, compared to measurement. So next slide, please. So here's where I bring in the Metropolitan State University Health Survey results that uh, Rocky Flats Downwinders and, and, and Tiffany um, helped make happen. Uh, they're, they're striking. So they, th this is not a proper epidemiological study. This is a convenience study. Um, it's a self-selecting sample. And, but but they, they asked people who lived in a certain area um, if they'd experienced health problems to complete a survey. And people did. And they found that um, preliminarily, the pre preliminary findings out of 1,745 surveys that were submitted, uh, 848 cases of cancer and um, of those 848 cases, 414 were rare, um, which means that about 49% of the reported cancers in this population were rare, whereas the national percentage of rare cancers is 25%. So we've, we've got twice the number of rare cancers around here than you'd expect nationally. 
And the most common cancers in the study in order of prevalence were breast, thyroid, prostate, and colon, but nationally thyroid cancer prevalence ranks ninth. So around here, thyroid is the second most prevalent cancer, but nationally it's, it's the ninth most prevalent cancer. And the, the thyroid is a radiosensitive organ. So uh, what, what's, if you could go to the next slide, this is what I find most striking about the Metropolitan State University Health Survey. They geoplotted the location of the residences of the survey respondents and overlaid the geoplots with the smoke plume from the 1957 fire and the Cray Hardy map. And you can see the correlation. Um, the, the area that, that they wanted to study was a big area. Um, I think it was Highway 93 to Highway 120, Highway 25, Interstate 25, and then Colfax all the way to Highway 7, Arapahoe Road on the north. That's a big area, but right here, basically south of Stanley Lake, um, th there's a gigantic cluster of reported cancers, and it correlates well. Yes, sir? What are those two maps? The one on the left is, um, the little black dots are where survey respondents lived, people who reported cancer. And the overlay with the colored bands is the smoke plume from the 1957 fire. And on the right, it's the same residential locations of the survey respondents. And the overlay, the colored bands, are the Cray-Hardy map um, plutonium concentrations. So to, to me, this is pretty striking evidence that at least further proper study needs to be done. OK, next slide, please. And you know, I, I've, I, I understand that you can't prove causality. Uh, Nick Hansen and Sasha Stiles and I had a meeting with uh, current Jefferson County Health Director Mark Johnson a month or two ago. And I asked him um, what studies can tell you. And his, his answer was, at best, they can tell you strong association between the presence of a contaminant and an increased incidence of disease. But I, I think there's probably a way to answer this question. Um, if, if you have a person who develops a cancer, uh, um, could, couldn't you collect the primary tumor, if possible, if it's not a leukemia or something like that, and analyze that primary tumor for plutonium content, specifically Rocky Flats plutonium content? Dr. Cobb did it with lung and liver tissues. I mean, I know, I know these things cost money and all that stuff, but this would be a way to address the causality question. If you, if you have somebody with a, a brain tumor and the person dies and, and you collect the primary tumor out of their brain, brain and find Rocky Flats plutonium in it, I would have to think that's pretty indicative. Um, next slide, please. Okay. I'm not making any ad hominem attacks on anybody here, okay? But I, I want to compare the qualifications of the people on the different sides, okay? Dr. Edward Martell, who started this whole thing when he noticed the Mother's Day fire in 1969, he was a West Point graduate. He had a PhD in radiochemistry. He studied the effects of radiation on humans in 1950s nuclear bomb tests in the Pacific. Carl Johnson, had a MD from Ohio State, a uh, master's in public health from Berkeley. He was a uh, colonel in the Army Reserve, and he specialized in radiation and e epidemiology. John Cobb was a department chair at uh, CU School of Medicine and a professor of preventative medicine, and he had a long history of, he was an ambulance driver in World War II and did a lot of health work in Africa and so on. Uh, Richard Clapp has a PhD in epidemiology, actually it's a SCD in epidemiology. He has a Master of Public Health from Harvard. He was director of the Massachusetts Department of Health Cancer Registry. Okay, so the, the, the people who are funded by the DOE to oversee the Rocky Flats site for CDPHE, Al Hazel, he has a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from CSU, and before getting into public health work, he worked as a salesman, a herdsman, and a mountain guide, according to his resume. Uh, Carl Spring, who currently holds this role, has a Master of Science from BYU in geology and worked as an exploration geologist in the oil and gas industry before becoming responsible for Rocky Flats oversight. 
speaks for itself to me. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and my, a favorite quote from Pat Schroeder, former U.S. Congresswoman Pat Schroeder from Colorado, I've yet to see an agency study itself and turn itself in. Um, and next slide, please. So what can you do um, about this? If, if you're sufficiently interested and motivated, you can take an interest in this subject. You can educate yourself. There's a, the data's out there. All you got to do is dig it up and... Uh, we're, there's a bunch of people who are trying to make it more accessible. Um, you can contact your elected officials with concerns over the refuge opening and the parkway construction. You can ask your elected officials to support an independent review of existing studies and ask them to support performing new soil studies before we do anything dramatic like build a toll road. You can express no confidence in the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment um, based on some of the things I've shown here tonight. You can lobby for signage around the refuge. You know, Wes McKinley, who was the foreman of Special Grand Jury 89-2, became a state, uh, he, he became a state house representative for this reason. Uh, he introduced legislation to try to get the state to put signage around Rocky Flats, and unfortunately, the legislation didn't pass. But um, there's no reason it couldn't be tried again. There's no reason it couldn't be tried at the county and local city government levels instead of at the state level. You can lobby for the unsealing of the records of Special Grand Jury 89-2. There is, um, it's, it's possible that there is contamination there that hasn't been discovered yet. Um, and before, before we do something like build a toll road, it seems to me we ought to find out everything there is to find out, everything that is known about what's there. Um, there's there's a, a rumor about uh, 1,400 barrels of buried radiation that wasn't uh, uh, dug up. There are rumors about buried pieces of heavy equipment, road graders and things out there at the site. You can complete the Rocky Flats Down Winters Health Survey. It's still open. Uh, if you know someone who has a rare cancer or something like that, lives in the affected area, have them complete the survey. The more, the more data, the better. And you can um, put Downwinder's doctors in touch with uh, Sasha Stiles. Uh, she's here tonight. And one of her goals is to develop a network of, of doctors who have treated Downwinder's and get the voice of the medical community active in this, in this matter. And finally, you can argue the issue in public forums. I, I was invited to this Arvada Neighbors Facebook group, even though I don't live in Arvada. And um, every once in a while, I'll see a raging debate about Rocky Flats. And uh, every once in a while, I'll just put in a reference to a study, and then I don't get any responses after that. <laughs> and um, I think that's all. <laughs>